are back to our study of Paul's first letter, the first letter we have preserved, that he wrote to the church in Thessalonica. First Thessalonians, we call it. We've been walking through that for the last number of weeks. Uh, we come to the end of chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. We're going to look at just uh, five verses. But want to begin with, I think, a very relevant conversation that Jesus had with Peter in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, Jesus gathers his disciples together for that Passover meal. We call it the Last Supper. He's instructing his disciples on what about is going to happen. Is going to happen and um, says, there's one among you that's going to betray me. And they're all like, no, that can't be me. Um, and then Jesus turns to Peter in Luke Chapter 22, verses 31, 32, in the midst of all that conversation, and they're talking who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom and, and all of that. And Jesus says to Peter this in Luke 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demands to have you that, you might, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Father, thank you for instruction of your word. Would you give us, would you give us ears to hear? Would you give us hearts to understand? What you want to communicate to us, we thank you for your word. It is indeed life and truth to us. It is our very sustenance. Father, thank you this morning for the gift of prayer being able to pray for others. Thank you for showing us how to do that, what that even looks like. And Lord, would you teach us this morning? In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So in the midst of all that, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I'm, gonna, I'm praying for you that your faith won't fail. But when you return, or when you when you have turned. Uh, obviously, Jesus knew something that Peter didn't know. He is going to fail. But when you turn, when you turn back, when you come back to your senses, basically, I want you to strengthen your brothers. Peter's immediate response is, Lord, I would never deny you. Mm. Jesus, I would never deny you. And, and Jesus said, you know what? You're going to deny me three times before this ordeal is over. Shortly after that, Jesus was betrayed, was tried, was beaten, and then was executed. And you can bet Peter, Simon here, Jesus uses an Aramaic name, Simon. Peter uh, was learning some things, don't you suppose? And Jesus prayed for Peter with full understanding that we are involved in a spiritual battle, and everyone who seeks to follow Jesus is in a spiritual battle. And Jesus did not pray for Peter to, to have all those trials removed, right? He didn't pray, I'm going to make all your difficulties come, go away. Jesus prayed for Peter and said, I'm going to strengthen you in the midst of your trials. Not remove you from your trials, but I'm going to strengthen you in the midst of your trials. And implying it's not going to go great for you, Peter, in the next few hours when you have turned again Strengthen others, strengthen your brothers. Reminded of the words of Hebrews 7, verse 25, Jesus said, or the writer of Hebrews said, Jesus lives to make intercession for us. Imagine that. Jesus lives to pray for us, to intercede for us. And God calls us to pray for others, doesn't he? He calls us to pray for one another, pray for people. So why don't we pray for people? any more than we do. Probably many reasons, isn't there? Probably many reasons surrounding our own egocentric worldview. The world revolves around me, and, and I got so many problems. How could I possibly lift my head out of my own difficulties and pray for somebody else? Those kind of reasons, I think, is why I don't pray more for people. I don't know about you. Maybe you have other reasons why you don't pray for people. Maybe God hasn't given us, we haven't received from God a, a heart of compassion like we ought to for others. Maybe we've been deceived in thinking everybody in the room is good except me. That's a thing, isn't it? 
Everybody I know is doing just fine except me. Everybody should be praying for me. How could I? There's no, well, there, what, is, what would there be to, for me to pray for others? God calls us to pray for others, and we don't do that as well as we should. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 to 13, the end of the chapter. We see Paul's prayer for the believers in Thessalonica. It's not a prayer to recite like we see from Jesus in uh, Matthew chapter 6, what we call the Lord's Prayer, or those prayers of Paul in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 and other places where we kind of recite them as uh, we follow Paul's verbiage verbatim. This is a, just a model. We see the attitude. We see Paul's heart, and I think we get some principles on how we are to pray for one another, a pattern, if you will, of how to pray for others. Um, not so much a how-to, because we can get all the how-to we want. I I'll say this often, uh, but if we don't have some want-to, right? If we want to, we're going to pray for others. Uh, so God, give us some want-to. This might be a little bit of how-to, but it's, it's just following. Uh, Paul kind of closes this section, this opening section of the letter, and then he's going to launch into all the things he wants to teach them. Um, he wants to be there, but until then, he's writing a letter and, and to, to explain some things to them. We get some insight into how it is we pray for people. Entitled this message, How to Pray for People. Right? How to Pray for People. Reminded of 1 Samuel 12, Samuel, uh, the, the nation of it, Samuel told Israel, you don't want a king. It's just not going to go well. Let's just follow God and we're going to do way better. No, we want a king. So, so God raised up Saul. And then shortly after, the people of Israel are are bemoaning the fact that they've got this earthly king that certainly isn't perfect, like the one true king, right? And so they're saying, Samuel, pray for us um, in, in all of our sins and all of our waywardness. Would you pray for us? Could you see it in your own heart to pray for us? And Samuel says in 1 Samuel 12, verse 23, far be it from me, far be it from me that I sin against the Lord and cease to pray for you. Isn't that something? Far be it from me to sin against God and cease to pray for you. Life is not every man for himself, right? Every man, woman, child for themselves. Good luck. Go get him. I hope you make it to the finish line. If you do, we'll see you there. The Christian life is we're all in this together, right? We're all in this together. We are all weak and frail, just like Peter. We think we can conquer the world by ourselves. Just like Peter, we find out maybe not, right? So we look at the theology of Paul's prayer life. We see that he almost always makes prayer requests that exalt Jesus, glorify Jesus. And not just, hey guys, uh, would you pray for me because I'm having a bad day? Nothing wrong with praying. God, would, would you help me? I'm having a bad day, right? But we look at Paul's prayer life and his, he prays for very little for himself. Prays an awful lot about might God be glorified. Paul prays things like, hey, would you pray for me that God would open a door for me and that he would give to minister to others and he would give me words so I could explain clearly in words that people can understand what Jesus has done for them? That's the kind of prayers Paul typically prayed. Second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, writes it in a letter, very humble of him, writes in a letter, I've got this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. Everybody's speculating on what could it be. Um, could it be a physical ailment? His letter to the Galatians seems to reveal maybe he had some eye trouble. Maybe that was it. Maybe it's just the oppression, the opposition that he's getting because he's sharing Christ and around the world. Maybe that's the thorn. Um, all kind of guesses. You know my, my guess. I... I I wonder if it wasn't his mother-in-law, but, <clears throat> but um, he had this thorn in the flesh. He said, I prayed three times that God would remove it, and guess what? God didn't remove it, but God spoke to me, 2 Corinthians 12. God spoke to me and said, son, my strength is perfected in your weakness, and so that you might not exalt yourself because of this amazing revelation I've given you, 
we're going to keep that thorn in the flesh. Isn't that interesting? To keep you humble, so you know that you're not invincible, so you know it's not your strength that you're doing what I am doing through you. Does that make sense? Uh, the Lord gave me this thorn in the flesh that I might not exalt myself. Beyond that, Paul's prayer life seemed to be even in the midst of his difficulty, and he's facing difficulty as he writes this letter to the Thessalonians. He said, God, would you, would you be glorified in my friends over there in Thessalonica? Would you be glorified in the churches in Rome? And this morning we're going to look at how to pray for people. We spend a lot of time praying for ourselves, don't we? If we spend much time in prayer, we're spending a lot of time praying for ourselves. Paul kind of teaches us how to pray for others. To have a posture, listen, to have a posture that is not just, I'm going to crawl up in a ball in a corner and I'm just going to hunker down and hope all my problems go away. God wants us to, to have a posture of, I'm going to get up and I'm going to see who I can help, right? I'm going to see who I can bless, see who I can pray for. Because left to ourselves, our circle, our circle of prayer focus, left to ourselves, will just shrink and shrink and shrink until it's a little dot, which is myself, right? Could anybody identify with that? I sure can. It'd just be, God help me. I can't get beyond that. I can't see beyond that. There's just so much clutter in my life. I can't see beyond that. Paul teaches us how to stand up above the clutter and say, God, I want to... I want to help other people, and I'm going to start by praying for them. So you ready? Here we go. We're going to go through here as quickly as we can. 1 Thessalonians 3, beginning in verse 9. Paul prayed, and he was thankful for the past. Thankful for the past. I think the first principle we see uh, in, these, in these verses, in these words. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 9 and 10. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly day, uh, night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Thankful for the past. Paul had just said, uh, as he's wrapping up again this introduction and and commending them for the faithfulness that they have exhibited, the way that they've embraced God's word and run with it, shared it with others. And he, verse 8, we finished last week with these words, for now we live if you are standing firm in the Lord. We, we are exhilarated, we're revived, literally we are revived to know that you are standing in the truth. And then he says, how can we possibly thank God enough for you? Praying for others. Reminded of the words of Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. It's probably a month ago, I was listening to the radio, and Erwin Lutzer was on the Long, long time pastor of Moody Church in, in Chicago. He is just recently uh, kind of transitioning out of senior position there. He's still teaching the Bible on radio and everywhere else. Um, and he's looking at these words. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And he asked the question of his congregation, which is easier, to rejoice with people when they're rejoicing or to weep when people are weeping? And I think initially we say, oh, well, it's way easier to rejoice with people who are rejoicing, right? But he challenged that and said, you know, a lot of times we'd rather weep with people that are weeping because when people are rejoicing, let's say they got, a, they got a promotion at work. Well, why didn't I get a promotion? They just got a new car. Well, I'm driving this thing that barely runs, Is that right? Sometimes it's hard to rejoice with those who rejoice, because, well, why didn't that happen to me? Why didn't that good thing, why didn't that ministry opportunity come my way? Why do they get such a blessing on their ministry? And, right? And I had to say, ouch. Sometimes it's easier to weep with those who weep. Comfort them. 
rather than rejoice with those who rejoice. Paul shows us how to do both. He rejoices with the believers. His heart is revived. How can I thank God enough? And he weeps with those who weep in the sense that he's going to recognize their weaknesses. First, thankful for their strengths. He is thankful for their strengths. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. Can't thank God enough. Words just can't express. In the midst of his own trials, difficulty, he's able to rejoice in their successes. Right? They were struggling as well. We know that. Uh, we've looked at that in the first three chapters. We know that they're struggling. But in the midst of Paul's difficulty, he's able to rejoice with his brothers in Thessalonica, their successes, the victories that they're winning in their own lives, in their community. People are coming to Christ, thanking God for his grace on his brothers, for God's gifts that he's been pouring out on these Thessalonian believers that are sharing their gifts, his care that he's given to them. And he's recognizing, recognizing God's work in their lives, and Paul rejoices. Paul's giving attention to their growth, and he gives God all the credit, right? Not, hey, you guys are just amazing. He's given God all the credit. That it both affirms them, right? Affirms them. Hey, God is using us, and it humbles them. It's not just us. It's the God who's called us, equipped us, made provision for us, right? They're thankful for their strengths. When we pray for people, Let's give, let's give God thanks for the qualities that God has put in their lives, right? Whether they're believers, followers of Jesus, or unbelievers, want nothing to do with God. All right, let's, let's give thanks. God's put something good in everybody, I believe. When we pray for people, we can, we can say, God, you put such a passion in my friend. They don't want anything to do with you, but Lord, what might they be like when they come to know you, right? That kind of thing, recognizing the strengths that they have put, God, that God has put in them. Does that make sense? Things that will be or will sometime may be useful for God's purposes. Paul was thankful for their strengths. Then in verse 10, he's mindful of their weaknesses. Mindful of their weaknesses. As we pray most earnestly night and day, he's mentioned this a couple times already, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Supply what is lacking in your faith. What is, is it some great moral sin or something they've done? We don't, we don't think that's the case. Seems like what Paul's referring to is doctrine. They need to be taught some things. or some things that Paul didn't have time to explain to them clearly. Things that Paul was learning from the Lord that he would like to share with them behavioral things, how to behave amongst one another, how to behave before a watching world, attitudes. All of this came from Timothy's observation. You remember when Paul and Silas, they, they couldn't get to Thessalonica. They said, Satan has hindered us from coming to you, but we're going to send, we're going to send Timothy. So Timothy went, uh, spent some time in Thessalonica and came back with a letter. This whole letter is a response to Timothy's report. And we get some hints what Paul's talking about in chapters 4 and 5. Most of Paul's letters are, the first half is theological. This is who God is. This is what he's done in you. The, the second half is typically practical. So there, this is what, how you're supposed to live. How you're supposed to do this and that in him. And so we're going to find out that Perhaps what Paul is addressing, the godly lifestyle here, guys, here's some things we've learned about how to live as believers in Jesus. He makes a statement, mind your own business. That could be a sermon to come, huh? Um, work hard, he, he mentions that. But really, really the overarching theme of this book, well, one is thank God for how you're doing, but second secondarily to that is the coming of the Lord. And he's going to spend quite a bit of time. We have a lot of our major insights about what the coming of the Lord will look like for the believer in Jesus. They had some ideas that, oh no, uh, my loved ones have died. So when Jesus comes, they're going to miss out, right? And we're going to, we're going to deal with Paul's response to that. Paul's not being judgmental. 
guys, I got to get over there and straighten some things up. God's being, or Paul's being discerning. He understood they, they weren't not com, quite complete yet, and there's some things that needed completing. Paul said the same thing to the church in Rome. Romans 1, verse 11. I long, said the same thing, I long to come and see you that I might impart some spiritual gift to you. Isn't that something? I long to come and be with you that I might impart some spiritual gift to you. So our response to that typically is, well, that's Paul, right? That's Paul. He has this big bag of spiritual gifts, and, and he's different because he's a Bible guy. You ever think that way? Well, these are Bible guys. They're supposed to say that. Um, what would Paul say to that? Paul would say, guys, the same Holy Spirit that worked through me is working through you. And God has gifted each one. Hadn't God called us? Hasn't God equipped us to, to minister to others, to serve others? When we fall for this trap of, well, that was a Bible guy. Now that Bible guy is connected to the same Lord that you are connected with if you are in him. To supply what was lacking in their faith, he said. When we pray for people, it is okay to recognize weaknesses, failures, right? It's sort of why we pray, isn't it? Because we, I know I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, we pray for, isn't that kind of why we pray? Because we all possess some weaknesses, some frailties, some failures and faults at times graciously, right? Graciously. Don't need to tear people apart in prayer. God knows them inside and out. He knows you and me inside and out, right? But directly. We can just ask God, God, would you... I sense this area in my brother or sister's life, and, and would you, Lord, would you address those areas in them, right? Now, let me say, I think it's pretty important, talking, kind of talking about solo prayer, right? When you're praying solo, as opposed to praying in a group, when you're praying in a group of people, you don't need to, you don't need to spread all Sister Mildred's dirty laundry, right? You, God shows you some things about Mildred that aren't right. You get alone with God. Does that make sense, right? We're not talking, Paul's talking in our personal prayer life. We can be aware of people's weaknesses. Let's be careful of that. I can't say that strongly enough. That's why so often... Church prayer meetings are called gossip sessions. Let's not, let's not perpetuate that false notion, right? Or let's not get that any, give that any traction. When you're praying solo, it's okay to see weaknesses in me and anybody else you're praying for and say, God, would you, would you, would you just shine some light, my brother, my sister? Right? That makes sense? Super quiet in here. Thankful for the past, that which has already happened, the things that have happened in the believers in Thessalonica. Paul's thankful for their strengths. He's mindful of their weaknesses, right, up to this point. Now Paul turns his focus on the present situation. Number two, strength for the present. Strength for the present. Verses 11 and 12, Paul writes, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you. Turns his attention to your current situation here, strength for the present. First, help from the outside. Help from the outside. Verse 11, we're praying that God will direct our steps, our way to you. Paul's talking about himself and Silas. But God would enable us help from the outside paul's earnest desire his earnest desire was to be there and help the letter writing the letter was good you can get some of this stuff out and congratulate them on how they're doing tell them we're praying for them saying we're proud of them letter was good but there's no substitute for real face-to-face -face interaction with them so paul said man we are praying we are praying god will direct our way to you he felt that he could be a great benefit to them. Who wouldn't love the Apostle Paul stopping by and saying, hey, he believed he'd be a great benefit. So he prays, Lord, direct our, that the Lord might direct our way to you. 
God was in charge. It wasn't, hey, we're doing everything we can, and we're determined, and we're going to get... No, if God would make a way. We're praying that God would make a way. God's in charge of this thing. Paul's not in charge, right? Paul literally begs God to allow him and Silas to visit them. And so far, it's not been possible. And as far as we know, as far as we know, it, it may have been another five years before Paul was able to get to Thessalonica. We don't have any record of him going back. Best we can do is in Acts chapter 20, uh, Paul's farewell address, where he went through Macedonia uh, in Asia Minor, uh, ended up staying in Ephesus for a while, giving that farewell address to the elders at Ephesus. He may have stopped by that. That was five years later that Paul might have been able to step by, stop by. But Paul prayed that they would have help from the outside, that others, if it wasn't him, others would come and, and help them. Paul recognizes the need, their need for help and for assistance, and he prays, God, maybe you would use me. If, if Silas and I, if you'd make a way for us to get there, we would love to help. At the time, there's not a lot of resources. There's not a lot of traveling evangelists going on. There's not a lot of literature about the Bible because all we had is the letters that are being circulated, eyewitness accounts of who Jesus was, what he'd done. Paul prays, hey, I think my brothers and sisters could use some outside intervention. Can I help? That's a great prayer, by the way. Hey, my friend can use some intervention. Is there anything I can do? It's a powerful thread that can be weaved through our prayers. Hey, I understand my brother, my sister, Mitchell, is in need of prayer. Is there something I can do? That is a great thread to weave through our prayer life, isn't it? I see this situation. Is there something I might be able to do? When we pray for people, let's ask God to send help. God, would you send some help? They, they have some trouble, whoever it might be, perhaps a source that we don't even know about, but God alone knows. A church that's in the vicinity. God, might you send somebody from that church or might you send another friend, a coworker, a complete stranger, a missionary. We're praying for people around the world. God, would you send a missionary with some truth of your word? God just might use you. He might just use me, right? Let's be open to that when we pray for others. It's the See a need, meet a, meet a need program. See a need, meet a need program. God, you've shown me this thing. Hmm, could it be that you want me to do something? So most Sundays, um, before anybody gets here, I will um, I'll go on my Facebook account, do a little check-in thing. Fake Facebookers know how that works. And then I'll say a little something. Sometimes just a humorous little, hey, Get out of bed and get to church, right? You, you heard me say that. Um, sometimes it's, God, would you, would you purify our hearts today? God, would you, would you hear our worship today? Those kinds of things, you know? Well, this morning, I posted, um, Lord, would you strengthen our hearts? It's from our text this morning. Just check in. Lord, would you strengthen our hearts? Ten minutes later, a uh, good friend of mine, pastors in Columbus, Nebraska, calls me. Hey, man, what's going on? I said, Jim, it's Sunday. Um, <laughs> so what are you doing? Oh, I just saw that you posted, Lord, strengthen our hearts. I wondered if something was, was going on. I said, Jim, you know, I just, no, it's just part of my, the text we're going to look at this morning, and I just threw it out there, and that is see a need, meet a need, isn't it? A brother thought, oh, wow, something's going on in Tom's life. He, he, that church needs their heart strengthened. I said, Jim, doesn't your church need your heart, their heart strengthened? <laughs> like, I think this is a group deal here. And, oh, okay, yeah, I, I get it, and we just had a great time of fellowship. And, and then um, he called me on the church phone for some reason, which that doesn't always work great, and boom, it disconnected, like God's saying, you guys get, need to get to work, I think. <clears throat> Help from the outside. Brother just sees, wow, Legacy Church might need something. I'm going to call and find out. Isn't that cool? That's how that worked. That, that thing worked. And I didn't say, hey, Jim, I need a sermon illustration on Sunday. Would you call me at 9 o'clock? <clears throat> it just, um, the Lord did that. 
Help from the outside. Secondly, hope from the inside. Hope from the inside. God would just send my friend or this person I know about or however that prayer need comes to our hearts. Would you send some outside help? Or God, would you send some inside help? Verse 12 again. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. From, Lord, would you send them some help from the outside to, Lord, would you stir up some hope on the inside, right? It's a difference, subtle difference there. God, would you, would you send some hope, some help from the outside, some resource that they don't currently have to, God, would you stir up hope from within, love for one another and love for others. Would you, would you make you increase God would make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, for all people. John writes, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. If we are growing in God, we ought to be growing in love, right? For one another and for the world outside. May the God who is love cause us to have an unselfish love that flows out of us, right? That's a great way to pray for others. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talking about um, being reconciling men to, to other men and reconciling men to God and all that he was doing in this ministry of reconciliation that he says God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. He goes on to say, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14, the love of Christ compels us. And Paul's praying for them. God, may your love compel these people to to love one another, to meet their, the needs of each other, and to love the world outside around them. To one another, to inside the, the community of believers, serving God's people when they have an opportunity, doing what we can to, to keep hope alive in one another. We have a ministry to one another in that, don't we? To do what we can to keep hope alive in one another because hope leaks out fast. You ever notice that? Hope leaks out fast, and we need to do what we can to keep hope alive in, in God's people. And then he says, and for all, those outside, those outside the community of believers. For Paul, that was just as important. Four weeks from today, we're going to be doing a Serve Sunday again, and the whole point of that is we are determined to step outside of our buildings, five churches, people stepping outside of the buildings and serving the community around us. Paul wrote to the Philippian church, Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, may you be blameless and innocent in this crooked and twisted generation so that you might shine as lights in the world. Right? Might you be blameless? Might you watch the way that you live? Blameless and innocent in this crooked and twisted generation that you might shine as lights in this world. There is hope available today. Did you know that? There's hope available today. Life doesn't have to be just a string of difficult, horrendous, unbearable situations after another. Right? There's hope available to know the one that created us. Right? We need to encourage one another with that. There's hope available today. We live in a world today that hope is diminishing, I think, rather rapidly. So many are living... Hopelessly, we as a church have an obligation, a responsibility to let people know that hope is available. Life is not a string of horrible day after horrible day, right? There is, doesn't have to be. There is hope available. So how is these young and struggling believers going to gain strength? By serving others in love, right? By stopping the posture of crumpling up in a ball and just all we can see is our own difficulties by standing up, taking a posture where we stand up and say, God, show me somebody I can help. That will go a long, long ways to, to stirring up hope in ourselves and, and in others. I believe that firmly. There are, there are ministries around the world where the whole focus is let's just get our to help you with your issue, your addiction, whatever it is, let's get your eyes off yourself and, and learn how to serve other people. It flies in the face, doesn't it? It flies in the face of our 
self-centered culture. I need to take me, care of me before I can give any attention to anybody else. That's certainly true at times, isn't it? There are times where we just got to take, but when we slump into this lifelong thing of, well, I just can't help anybody until I can help myself, let's be careful of that, huh? Most of us, I think, most of us need, myself included, maybe, maybe we need to get our eyes off ourselves and serve somebody else, right? And that will strengthen us. Believe that firmly. That could have been a sermon all its own, but, but we got to move on. When we pray for others, let's pray for strength from outside sources and from the inside sources, the things that God has already put there. God, might they increase in the love that they have for one another, and might they increase in the love that they have for all outside the church. Strength for the present. Outside help, inside help. Third, perseverance for the future. Perseverance for the future. We're praying for people. Paul now, he looked at the past, look what God has already done there, what they're doing. Then he turns his attention to the present. Now he turns his focus to, all right, moving forward. Verse 13, so that all of that love abounding to one another and for all, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. And he might establish our hearts in holiness. Peter said it this way, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. Be holy in all of your behavior, like he who is holy called you, like the one, the holy one who called you. Be holy in all of your behavior, like the holy one who called you. Our hearts are established when we're committed to God's ways, right? We're not, we're not compromising and wobbling back and forth. Our hearts are established when we are committed to God's ways. The word holiness means set apart. Biblical holy, godly holiness is set apart for God's purposes. I, my life is committed, committed to, to God's ways. That's what holiness is, and that's what God calls us to, right? Peter's... 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify your hearts in the Lord, right? Commit yourself to his ways. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. That's the goal, right? Sinless perfection is the goal. I'm guessing most of us haven't made it there yet. If you're perfect, let me know afterwards. But holiness and blamelessness is that desire to be set apart, fixing our aim on God's standards, his ways, when we're committed to God's ways, our hearts are confident and courageous and secure. We are established. Does that make sense? We're committed to the ways of God. Not, well, you know, I, I think maybe I'll try this, or maybe God wasn't really shooting me straight on that, and we're, we're not established. We're wobbly. When we live in compromise, our hearts are wobbly, right? Our hearts are insecure, tentative, weak. That affects our prayer life. That affects our witness. As Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, it leads to that place where you're tossed to and fro by the waves and every wind of doctrine. What a picture that is. Tossed to and fro by the waves and every wind of doctrine. Well, I think I'm going to follow God today. Well, no, I don't like that. I'm going to go over here. Well, this guy says I should live this way and I should believe this. Right? That's that just what a picture of being tossed around by the waves. Established, that your hearts be established in holiness. When we pray for others, let's ask God to strengthen and establish their hearts. That's what I laid out on Facebook this morning. Lord, strengthen our hearts today. May we be committed to his ways. Remove, God, would you remove the distractions so I can see who you are, what you're calling me to do, what you're telling me to do, by the way, that might be the number one thing you could pray for me. God, would you let Tom's heart be established in your ways? Jour a strength for the journey. First point. Did I ever even get to that? Nope. First point under perseverance for the future that I just talked about. Strength for the journey. Strength for the journey. 
As you're going, guys, as you're going from here, I'm praying God would establish your hearts, strengthen your hearts. And secondly, lastly, faith that will endure. Faith that will endure. As the coming of the Lord Jesus with all of his saints. Faith that will endure. A commitment to holiness during the journey is going to greatly be affected by our view of the end of the journey, right? I'm on this journey. It's super hard. Where are we going, Dad? I don't know. We're just driving, right? That's not going to do much for the difficulty on the journey. Where are we going? We're going to glory. Oh, that helps. That makes sense? Our view, our commitment to holiness during the journey is greatly affected by our view of the end of the journey, the finish line. John said it this way, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. When we see him, we will be like him. Tell me that isn't a finish line vision. When we see him, we will be like him. No more struggles. When we see him, we're talking 4K view of where we're headed. Not a fuzzy, well, I don't know, I just hope everything that I'm struggling with ends someday, and I hope maybe that'll be better than... No, a crystal clear vision of where we're going. Paul prayed for these believers at Thessalonica. Paul prays that they would live with eternity in view, that they would make daily decisions with eternity in view, that unimaginable victory that lays ahead. Doesn't that make today a little bit easier? Doesn't it make the journey a little bit easier to know what lies ahead? The, uh, the eyes on the prize kind of mentality. I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, who he is, what he's done for me. Because we can, we can walk in victory today because victory is certain tomorrow. And we're not sure where we're heading. The journey seems pretty long. The troubles on the journey seem unbearable. When we pray for others, let's pray they have endurance perseverance to the end. Embrace their reward all the way, right? We can put on the gold medal because the gold medal's coming, right? If you're walking in Jesus, if you've trusted him, perseverance for the future. Strength for the journey. God, as my friend moves ahead, might he be strengthened on his journey? Might he have a clear vision, a faith that will endure to the end? I think that's a great pattern for prayer, for praying for other people, right? Past, God, thank you for what you've done in and with my friend. Thank you for their strengths. And Lord, help them in their weaknesses, right? Strength for the, the, the present. And God, would you shore up the things that they need shoring up? Would you give them help from outside? Would you give them help from the inside? And then... Perseverance for the future. Lord, moving on, would you, would you strengthen them? Just concluded this message with, I think, a very clear question that comes out of this passage, these words of Paul. Are we using the gift of prayer to minister to others? Simple enough. Are we using the gift of prayer to minister to others? God has given us, God has given us this precious gift, gift wrapped for us, and it is the gift of prayers for others. Are we using, have we even opened up that toolbox yet in praying for others? Paul gives us some resources. I hope that's helpful. The way Paul prayed for people, I hope that's helpful. Um, I think it honors God. I think it meets people where they're at. Huh? Let's pray for people. Let's pray for people. Here's a, here's a, here's a homework assignment. Because I know you love homework assignments. Here's a homework assignment. Um, this next week, pray for three people that you're convinced are walking with Jesus, and pray for three people you're convinced or you know, sure don't think they're walking with Jesus, and just pray for them. Pray for their past, thankful of the gifts that God's given them and the areas that they're maybe struggling in. Pray for their present situation, and pray for them moving forward. How about that? Yeah. Next week, pray for three people that... You, God alone knows who's where, but people that you, that you see are connected to Jesus and three people you really don't see are connected to Jesus 
And let's pray. Let's learn how to pray for people. I think we need to learn how to pray for people, don't we? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your prayers for us. Thank you, Lord, for showing us your words to Peter on that day where he needed to be challenged, he needed to be strengthened. And he needed to be assured that when he returns, then he can move on to strengthen others. Father, we believe that's a word for us today. Jesus, we, we're absolutely humbled that, that you live to intercede for us. God, it seems like each one, to each one of us, like you've got a whole day's work just on me. Jesus, thank you for praying for us. Lord, may we not forgive us when we slip into this thing, well, if Jesus is praying for him, why do I need to? You have called us to pray for people. Lord, might we do it fervently, passionately. Might we do it consistently. Because, Lord, we're all, we're all struggling. We are all struggling cling to you, to living in you, for you, in the midst of this world. So Lord, would you open our eyes to our need to pray for one another. And for that, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.